Our New Testament reading for this morning is from Paul's letter to the church at Colossae, otherwise known as Colossians. It's the third chapter, verses 17 through the first verse of chapter 4. So here it is. Whatever you do, whether in speech or action, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus and give thanks to God the Father through Him. Wives, submit to your husbands in a way that's appropriate in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives. Don't be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything because this pleases the Lord. Parents, don't provoke your children in a way that ends up discouraging them. Slaves, obey your masters on earth in everything. Don't just obey like people pleasers when they're watching. Instead, obey with the single motivation of fearing the Lord. And whatever you do, do it from the heart for the Lord and not for people. You know that you'll receive an inheritance as a reward. You serve the Lord Christ. But evildoers will receive their reward for their evil actions. There is no discrimination. Masters, be fair and just to your slaves, knowing that you yourselves have a master in heaven. These are the words of God for the people of God. Well, this morning, this is our last in our series of messages called The Anchor in the Storm. And today's message is called Clothed in Christ. So as we come to this last message from our study, I, I want to go back to the beginning for a minute to remind us of where we began this journey. So imagine that you're hearing this letter being read to you for the very first time. Paul is writing it to you. So if it helps to hear it, to picture it, close your eyes. We always give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. We've done this since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all God's people. You have this faith and love because of the hope reserved for you in heaven. This message has been bearing fruit and growing among you since the day you heard and truly understood God's grace. In the same way that it's bearing fruit and growing in the whole world. Because of this, since the day we heard about you, we haven't stopped praying for you and asking for you to be filled with the knowledge of God's will, with all wisdom and spiritual understanding. We're praying this so that you can live lives that are worthy of the Lord and pleasing to Him in every way by producing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God by being strengthened through His glorious might. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read those words, I got the feeling that they were kind of um, buttering me up, that they were telling me something really good about me, like, like they might be building me up because something hard's going to come along that they want me to do. Maybe it would be bad news. news. I, I mean, I don't know what, but certainly it could be one of those storms of life that they're getting me ready for. But then right after those words, we heard that Christ Jesus, very God of very God, is there to rescue us. To rescue us from what? Well, the letter says to rescue us from darkness. And when we struggle, when we face those storms of life, it feels like darkness like a dark cloud can set over you and just keep you from any kind of sense of joy or rays of sun. And no matter what, you know what? There just always seem to be those things in life that we cannot manage 
on our own. There will always be those kinds of things that we can't change, that we can't manage, that we can't cope with, that we don't and can't solve on our own. And you know, I think some people that don't know Christianity, who don't know Christians very well, sometimes see that we kind of hold this like as a fantasy world. You know, like everything is sweetness and light and God will make everything light and easy and God will fix it all. But you know, that's not what we read about in the Scripture, is it? There will always be darkness. There will always be storms. The good news, the good news of the Gospel is that Jesus Christ is our rescuer. He's our anchor in the storm. And what's another name for rescue? Salvation. Salvation. So then, from there, the letter went on to say, hold on to Christ by faith. Hold together in love. Get rid of the excess baggage that can sink your boat and fill the deck up with the clothing of a new life. A new life filled with the freedom of Christ. The old has passed away. The new's coming in. No longer under the thumb of a law. And now, now we are to reflect, to be like Jesus, to be His image, the One who created us. And what is the image of Christ? It says, in this image, there's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian or Scythian, slave or free. You ever wonder, what is a Scythian? Well, if you've, if, if you've ever watched the Star Wars series and you see a Sith in the Star Wars, that's kind of what they're like. Well, seriously, really. That's where the name comes from. But Christ is in all things and all people. We are one in Christ. That's what Paul wrote to us about. But doesn't that lead to confusion? Freedom to do, to be anything, that everyone is alive. We can look around us and see the results of total freedom. You know, there's more than one of us in this room who remembers the 60s and talking about the free love and, and anything goes. And today we kind of reap the results of that, whether it's unwanted advances um, that end up with things like the Me Too movement because we've gotten into abuses where what is a freedom to one is, encro is, is just totally taken over somebody else. And this whole anything goes business, it's anything goes as long as it doesn't get in my way. I mean, everyone's entitled to their own way, just let me have mine. And of course, that kind of leads to what's the new highest good in our land today? It's called tolerance. Well, not the kind of tolerance we talked about last week, where tolerance is patience with people who just kind of rub us in the wrong way. No, this kind of tolerance they're talking about is I get to have it my way and you can't tell, and please don't tell me that my way is wrong. Uh, and of course that leads to a whole different set of problems. I mean, what if all the rules of the road, you know, drive on the right, stop at the stop signs, only go so fast, and everybody got to do and drive just exactly the way they wanted to, well, it all works fine until your rules don't clash with my rules. And, well, <laughs> you can imagine what that would be. Um, and what about this newfound freedom in Christ where we're all equals in the eyes of God, neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised? And in other passage, Paul actually says, neither male nor female. How does that work out? I mean, really it can get unbelievably complicated, doesn't it? Where you don't even know if it's okay to open the door for somebody anymore. But here it is. Paul writes to people about how to live with each other in very practical kinds of ways. He's writing into a society that had their own rules, that had their own standards. It was 
in the ancient Roman Empire, um, in, in ancient Roman Empire, it was a man's world. Nothing like today. It was a man's world in politics, in the economy, in the family, where the men held all the power and the purse strings. They even decided whether a baby would live or die. Absolute power over his household, over his children. If the children angered him or they even just displeased him, it was perfectly legal for him to disown his children, sell them into slavery, or even just have them killed. And of course, that would have included adult children. Only the father, the head of the house, could own property. Whatever the age of the children were, until their father died, they couldn't have their own. They could only have an allowance. But at the same time, while men had all the formal power, women had their ways of exerting influence. Um, more behind the scenes, in an upper, upper level, upper income family, um, the woman of the house would manage the household and would be expected to help her husband rise up in social ranks. And I can kind of suspect, you can kind of imagine that in a circumstance like that, there'd probably be some pretty serious scheming that goes on behind the scenes that you just don't necessarily know about it. But you see, the, the influence of women while it could be in the background, only went so far because the father was in charge. He had, he had the authority to decide whether newborn babies would stay alive. See, what would happen is the midwife would receive the child after birth and literally lay it on the ground. And if the father picked it up, it was welcomed into the family. If not, it was taken outside to a designated place and put on the ground where it was either left to die from exposure or somebody else would come along and take it to sell it into slavery. So any deformed or any Santana would have been left out on the garbage heap to die. That's the way it was. That's the way it was. And you can imagine just someone that was over, was not wanted, would be mostly girls. So, that's the kind of world that Paul was writing into. And even into slavery, you've heard me talking about that a number of times already. Already, So there was no feeling of injustice about that because that's just the way it was and that's what Paul was writing into. And in some ways, as you start describing this imbalance between men and women, between children and their fathers and slaves and, and their owners substitute employers, employees. This, the descriptions are really not all that far off from our family relationships that we watch in the world today. I mean, not, definitely not that harsh. Definitely not that far down the road. In some parts of the world it is still just exactly like that where you have abusive men, or at least men that are overbearing, controlling, demanding, or women who work out of the background and scheming to manipulate men in their lives because after all, there's no justice for the controlling man who could simply overpower them. And there's still the abused, abandoned children you know, when we had the folks from Circle of Care visit not too many months ago, they told us about the great need for foster and adoptive families because there are still so many children who are either abandoned or abused. Even today, you know, we don't have slavery out in the open, but when we talk about human trafficking, when that's in the news, that's about selling people into slavery. So the setting might have changed, but the world hasn't necessarily changed all that much in some ways. In some ways. 
So when we talked about the qualities that we wanted to put on last week, the godly qualities like compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forgiveness, and love, in some ways it's easy to put those on as followers of Jesus in the outside world. In, in, in church, it's easy to put those on. Or with the people that we're close to, it's easy to put those on when it's all out there in plain view. But behind closed doors or inside where we have long-standing relationships, where we have long-standing patterns that are hard to break, it might not be quite so easy. And some of those old things can hang on in plain view. Let me give you an example of what I mean. When Lucy and I first started dating in our first years in marriage, we had a really neat relationship. Yes, we still have a really neat relationship, but... But when our first child was born, after a little while, um, I heard words and tone of voice come out of my mouth that I went, where did that come from? They were the same words and same tone that my dad would have used. And the same thing happened to Lucy. Where did that come from? Now we could go off and talk about that for a little while, but all I want to tell you about is that sometimes those roles and the things that we behave just kind of come up from the way we were raised, from the culture that we live in, and we're not even conscious, aware of where they've come from. And Paul is teaching us here in Colossians that we have to put on new things on purpose. Because so whether those roles are trained to us through culture, society, or whether we learn those things from our houses and families of origin, those great qualities of compassion, kindness, gentleness, humility, patience, forgiveness, and love can slip away. And so Paul gives special instruction to women, children, slaves, but he also zeroes in on those who hold the power, those that would never be held to account in those days of Rome because they had the power and what they said goes. So let's look at those things real quickly between that Paul was talking about in this little letter. He said, wives, submit to your husbands in a way that's appropriate in the Lord. I wonder if Paul had in mind those back channels, the back ways of thinking about influencing people. I mean, at first blush, you could look at it and think, I wonder if Paul is just accepting or even endorsing the way men treated women. For that matter, the way men in the time we live in are accused of treating women. But then immediately, immediately he said, husbands, Love your wives. Don't be harsh with them. And it was just just a chapter or two before where Paul sets out what's the standard for love. The standard for love is Jesus Christ who died and gave Himself for us, for the church who is described as what? The church is described as the Bride of Christ. And here Paul's saying, Husbands, love your wives. And then, children, obey your parents and everything because that pleases the Lord. Don't keep thinking of your parents as people who are out to use you as a child for their own gratification as you're in the Lord. But by the same token, we turn to the people in power. Parents, don't provoke your children in a way that ends up discouraging them. See, for them, at that time, overly harsh could literally mean leaving an infant out to die, sold into slavery. So children obey, but parents don't provoke. Slaves, employees, obey your masters on earth, in everything. Don't just obey like people pleasers when they're watching. 
instead with the single motivation of fearing the Lord. But then he turns right around to the masters who had complete and total control whether they lived or whether they died, and he says, Masters, be just and fair to your slaves, to your employees, knowing that you and yourselves have a master in heaven. When they heard that letter, this would have been absolutely, incredibly remarkable then as it is now. There's a mutual relationship, mutual responsibility to each other. These are incredibly practical, actually where you live implications of what it means to put on compassion, kindness, gentleness, humility, forgiveness, and love. We don't have time this morning to really look more in depth at those kinds of relationships and the implications for our daily lives. Um, the qualities that we take off and the ones that we put on as we withstand the storms of life. Of course, it's easier, it's always easier to see um, some other person besides ourselves fail in those things of compassion, kindness, gentleness, humility, forgiveness, and love. But this letter is a call a call to look closely at ourselves to be certain that we are with the power of the Holy Spirit and the forgiveness of Christ that we are each putting on compassion, kindness, gentleness, humility, forgiveness, love. And then Paul wraps up this whole instruction letter, this whole instruction document about difficult times he uh, that are ahead, we know. We know we're saved. We're rescued by Christ. We have a new relationship with bound up in faith and love, and we're learning how to be a community. A community with the foundation of God's love, where corruption of lust, evil desire, greed, anger, rage, malice, slander are all set aside, taken off, and where they're replaced by compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, tolerance, forgiveness, love. And I pray you've experienced God's love and compassion even in sometimes this very brief introduction here with this community, here in this sanctuary and through this town, but there's still one more step. Paul takes us one more step in this adventure of a storm. One more element that's crucial to everything working together for good, and that's prayer. Prayer. Here's what Paul said. It comes in the paragraph right after the one that we read. It's in Colossians 4, verses 2 to 6. Keep on praying and guard your prayers with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray for us also. Pray that God would open the door for the Word so that we can preach the secret plan of Christ, which is why I'm in chains. Pray that I might be able to make it as clear as I ought to when I preach. Act wisely towards outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Your speech should always be gracious and and sprinkled with insight so that you may know how to respond to every person. Keep on praying. And he says, guard your prayer with thanksgiving. I don't know about you, but I can get wrapped up in praying and asking for what I need and forget what God has already done for me. We can get wrapped up in asking for what we need and forget what God has already done for us. In everything, give thanks. Cultivate a thankful heart. So where do we end? Where do we end this series called The Anchor in the Storm? One, put on Christ. Two, take off the old stuff. Three, put on the new. 
and pray always. Let's pray. Father, You've given us Jesus Christ. You've given Him to us as our rescue, as our salvation in the storms of life. And You said that You would carry us. Oh Lord, that we would depend on You. Throw off that baggage that we don't need. That we would clothe ourselves in You. In You alone. Father, thank You for all that You've given to us in this life. For it's in Your name I pray. Amen.